Yeah, right. The well, last <laughs> week was too Cleveland, and we've been in Indianapolis, yeah. and you know, it sounds like uh, um, Howard Dean. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to Indianapolis, and we're going to Kansas City, and we're going to <laughs> woo. <laughs> Yeah, right. The last <laughs> week was too. Huh? That's live. Let's tweet this bad boy. We can get going here. That. This is real professional. Hello there, and welcome to the Hawkeye Hotspot Podcast. It is Friday morning, April the 12th, a little after 9 a.m. Central Time. I have not been abducted. I am not in witness <laughs> protection if you're watching on YouTube. I am at a hotel uh, somewhere in eastern Kansas, across the river from Kansas City. Daughter has a volleyball tournament this weekend. I am Rob Howe. That is Scott Docterman, and we're going to get through this thing. And We're a day late, maybe a dollar short, but... Uh, it's been a busy week, Scott. It's been a busy time. It's been a busy like winter into spring with uh, good stuff. Women's basketball playing till the very last game of the season, and for us in the media and for consumers, that pushes spring football back a little bit. But we've been able to produce some content from that this week, and it feels like we're kind of getting back to normal here. Yeah, it is a little bit normal. I mean, I think the weather's there too, and then the fact that we actually got to go out and. See a little bit of football practice uh, on Thursday. It wasn't very long, but it was enough to where, oh, okay, well, we can kind of see them moving around, and they're actually having practice, so that's good. But, you know, it, it is a good thing for the for the fan base, for sure, that, you know, the, the, the women's basketball team can play all the way until Sunday and deliver incredible ratings along the way and and deliver incredible memories along the way. And, and of course they were a content boon for all of us. And, and uh, it's probably not the worst thing in the world for football to be, you know, less under the microscope that it usually is this time of year that for the first two to two and a half weeks of camp, it was just kind of overlooked by, you know, we didn't, you know, it's like, uh, is anything really going on over there or not? But, you know, now for the, you know, we have the spring game coming up a week from tomorrow and then it's over and it's like, wow, okay. Where did this all go? Yeah, it moves quickly, and uh, yeah, and I, I think from a football perspective, and we'll talk to about we'll talk spring football a little bit here. What we heard this week from some of the we got players on defense and offense this week, and uh, both talked about the new offense being installed. Tim Lester's offense, first time they've gone through this in some in quite some time, so it's a different spring, just a different spring feel when you're doing when you're having an install like that and new terminology and all that. But we'll get into that in a minute. Um, Scott, I wanted to start, and I think it's probably best to start with whatever is new and news. Mm -hmm. And uh, for us last night, that was um, I, I was on the road, so I didn't see it as much and see the reaction. So I'll let Scott give more feedback in terms of that. But I think the basic basic gist of it is what we've been talking about. Uh, on this podcast for several years, and that's how do you split up the pie, right? How do you split up the financial pie that's coming in now with NIL, <clears throat> Transfer Portal, and you have a limited amount of funds. Most schools do. Some don't. But uh, for Iowa, where is that money being allocated? Is you know We saw last year um, with football, there was acquisition in terms of Cade McNamara and crew. This year, there was retention in terms of Jay Higgins and crew. Um, it's different in basketball. I think it's plain, painfully obvious that it's a different um, different market in basketball, Scott. And uh, Fran said as much last night. He said Tony Perkins' market value was a half a million dollars, and they couldn't afford it. And uh, we pretty much said that on this podcast. But it's it's different when I think it comes from the head coach. Sure. And yesterday he said it at the Presidential Committee on Athletics, which is a monthly meeting. It involves uh, the hierarchy of the athletic department and it also involves a handpicked crew for that's, that represents the president of the university. And every month they invite a, a different coach to come and talk about their sport. And sometimes it's golf, sometimes it's soccer. And in this case, it was Fran's turn, you know, with the season being over with. And, and Fran goes probably about every other year. And in this case, uh, he was talking about the the transfer portal and and the 
and also NIL. And he said that NIL was a good thing, but then he said when, with you know, he said this message all along, you know, that the NIL with um, the transfer portal is free agency and pay for play. And then he brought up uh, Tony Perkins situation that he loves him. He wishes he could stay, but he has a mark. He said this, he has a market value of $500,000 and we couldn't afford to keep him. And so now he has the opportunity to go out and make that. Now is Fran embellishing on the number? There's potential for that. I mean, I would I mean, Fran uses a lot of superlatives and you just, sometimes you got to knock him down a few pegs on that, but let's say it's $300,000. Let's say it's $350,000, which I think if you're looking at what you have, that's an accurate number. Um, and second team, second team, all big 10. I mean, right. you know, exactly. he's an established guard. You know, he's going into his fifth year. He was injured and played through the injury the last part of the year, 14 points a game. Um, you know, has been a part of a, a big 10 tournament championship team, you know, NCAA tournament teams in his career. Um, and, I think the majority of the fan base rebelled against that number. And at least I feels like I, I got the brunt of that yesterday and I tried sorry, to, sorry, I missed that. I was driving. <laughs> no, I'm not sorry. Yeah. I was going to say, you want to jump in and <laughs> you know, that would, that would be helpful, but, but you know, this is, it, it's naive to think that players aren't getting those types of paychecks and high upper level basketball players. And of course that, that consists of, at least two thirds of the fans saying, well, he, he doesn't play defense. He's not that good. We don't need him. He He's not even worth 500 bucks. If you ask me, well, nobody's asking you. First of all, nobody gives a shit what you have to say. Second of all, that's what it is. And that's where Iowa is. They don't have the money to keep up. And some of their rivals and regional opponents do, you know, I mean, right now it's what Mizzou and Indiana are probably the top two choices for him. One's in your league and been in your league for since the same day, December 1st, 1899. The other one's on your border and has been since 1846 when those borders were established. And they have more resources than you do in basketball. And how do you get there? Well, it's donations. Now, because one person asked me, does this come from the university? Or from? And I'm like, I just wrote like a 2000 word story about pay for play. It drives me crazy. But this is where you are. This is where you sit. And if you can't afford to keep your own players who have value like that, you are going to be a feeder to the rest of the schools around you. And if you think you're worried now, if you think that, that I'm embellishing or exaggerating or, or fear mongering with this, just wait till after next year when Owen Freeman's first team all Big Ten. Or if Peyton Sanford comes back and he has the opportunity for one more year, you know, just, I don't even know if he does. So maybe I'm, I'm off on that one, but specifically with Owen Freeman, um, you know, he was freshman of the year in the big 10. What happens next year if he's first team all big 10 and his st sticker will probably be beyond 500 K. And if you can't afford that, then again, you are going to be a triple a affiliate for major college basketball and I know you don't want to hear it. I know people don't want to like it. How can Iowa be this for? Well, it is, period. <laughs> and Iowa fans are going to have to de de decide. Now, there's a lot of factors into this, Rob, and we all know. You know, the men's basketball program, the apathy that is there, it's it's obvious. The dis dislike, disdain, um, uncomfort, apathy with the head coach, it's there. But the reality is that if you can't keep up in this – arms race then you're going to get overrun and it's going to happen and it's starting right now with your starting point guard yes and it's not going to change anytime soon the landscape isn't going to change it should and we've talked about it on the podcast if you put nil under the university athletic department umbrella and the NCAA does what it should have done at the beginning. And I'm not going over this again with no. how bad they, the NCAA has, has screwed this up. We know it's a, it's a Mickey Mouse organization that's really messed this up and gotten us to this point. But now that's macro. More micro with Iowa is how is Iowa going to be able to um, compete with the competition in terms of NIL? Because – as Scott said, if you're losing your starting point guard to Indiana in your own league, 
that I mean that that's pretty black and white to me, Scott. That's you, you know, you can't afford to keep a guy you want, and he's going to somebody that you potentially play two, maybe three times a year. Maybe not now with the expansion, but I mean, it's not something you can wait till tomorrow to do. They've got to figure out how to do this and figure it out quick because we saw the attendance numbers this year. And again, we've talked the layers of this. You're going to have people that say, well, you get a new head coach. That's going to inspire. No, that's going to create excitement and that will bring money in. But you, you got, you have to find something sustainable and Iowa doesn't have that right now. And I, and I don't know how they go about doing that. Bob, as we know, this is about a 25 year problem for yeah, Iowa men's basketball, least. you know, and it's not just because they haven't been to the sweet 16 in that year. I mean, it's really kind of crazy that they haven't accidentally won a second round game in that time frame. but, but they haven't, you know, that's the reality. But what it is is that there has been a, the slow trickle and at times the downpour of apathy and no matter what, from where they were in the mid nineties and late nineties in interest from the fan base, it slowly declined. You know, Steve Alford, when he came in, it was probably at a zenith. There was the interest. There was the, the excitement. People would have donated to an NIL. I mean, the whole season was sold out, you know, going into that. And then they beat UConn, the defending champion in the first game. And then the slow decline started. The coach, obviously. The, the coach did not work well with the, with the fan base. Um, then you had, um, you know, the Pierre Pierre situation, which I think was really – uh, a big hole in the, in the levy. <laughs> that may and, have been the most impactful. That, to me, that was more impactful than not making the sweet 16. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong on that. And, and maybe as we get away time-wise from the Pierre Pierce thing, it's not as impactful now, but I think it just, cr it created a crater mm -hmm. in the middle of that decade where it just, I'm not sure I was really recovered. From. I, I agree wholeheartedly because I think that the people who were, Iowa fans, let's not say crazy, passionate Iowa fans, but people who are Iowa fans were so disgusted by what happened that they were like, I'm not even going to watch them anymore. Yeah, you the know? people are listening that didn't live through that. I mean, picture people picketing outside of Carver Hawkeye Arena before games, editorials to newspapers. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was bad. It was it got really ugly. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about a, a player sexually assaulting another athlete on campus and then you have everybody deciding that that player was going to redshirt and, you know, you have prominent people suggesting that they need to work together, you know, in, in, in religion. And you have, and now that, that just seems preposterous, but in the early two thousands, that's what happened. And then he came back and then he got, then it happened again. So when you have that um, situation coupled with um you know, a coach that people didn't like, who didn't respond well at all to that situation. And then they're, they're forced to kind of root for a guy. And then he, all of a sudden it happens again and he ends up going to prison. <laughs> you know, that just the, I would say the everything but the top passionate 25% of the fan base was really turned off and it was really just kind of like, yeah, I like him, but I don't like this. And then you replace that guy you distance yourself from Pierre Pierce and then you bring in the worst coach you ever had. And that sends him, you know, he's 38 and 58 in three years, worst record there, in Minton history. There was excitement there too, Scott. Yeah. I mean, he could be part of it was because he wasn't Steve Alford. You're right. I'd look later. And part of it was because, you know, everybody was like, Hey, we're turning the page and, you know, maybe we can make the sweet 16 and let's move on. And there was a rally at Carver Hawkeye arena. Mm -hmm. which, like, I yeah. remember. I don't mm -hmm. think they had that with Fran. No, I don't remember a rally with Fran. It was maybe on a smaller scale, but that was a decent sized rally for Todd Licklider, and people were pretty charged up for him. Exactly, and um, and you would look at the coaches. I think I, I may still even have the paperwork from that, but the coaches that have wanted that job because they felt like it was a chance. I mean, Tom Crean was one of them when he was at Marquette. And yeah, Greg Marshall and and some really good coaches were interested, and then they ended up picking. Lick lighter. And, you know, he took, he was the national coach of the year. He took his team to the sweet 16 uh, that year and it, it imploded and the apathy just went, you know, and, and I always say, I, I think the, the two major, you know, really you look at the major factors. One was Tom Davis's ouster 
I would say the majority of fans agreed with, but it still didn't wear well with people because he's such a good guy and they had such a good era. Pierre it, was Pierce, ha- it wasn't handled well. The end right. Was and I don't know if it could have been improved. It, they kind of butted heads, he and Bolsby, uh-huh. but whatever. It did not, it just did not look good publicly the way it was handled. He makes the sweet 16. Mm-hmm. Just, it was not good. Yeah. And then Pierce and then Todd's first year. I, I don't know if people remember this or not, but um, that was the first year of BTN. And Mediacom didn't have BTN. So you couldn't watch the same games that you did locally on what KGAN or mm-hmm. KWQC in the Quad Cities or, uh, you know, I think it was KDSM. I want to say in Des Moines, I could be wrong about that. But you couldn't watch them over the air. The best players had already left Adam Poloska for the NBA, Tyler Smith for uh, Tennessee. So they weren't very good. They were boring because of style of play. They weren't on TV. Um, you couldn't see him on TV. And then there was a lot of weather issues that first year. There were a lot of really bad weather games. And so it became out of sight, out of mind. And then they never dug out of that hole. So Fran came in in 2010 and I think he delivered for the most part in, in, in a, his first four to five years. They, they got better. They became an interesting team. They recruited fairly well. They had all the, the, you know, the, 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 the abilities to move forward, but over the last, I'd say eight to nine years, probably since 2016, I think 2016 might've been the tipping point when they were started off 10 and one in the big 10 ranked as high as number two or three in the country. And then, and then faltered and finished 12 and six and lost six out of the last eight. I think from that point on, it's been this kind of, you know, holding water kind of thing where, you know, it's up and down, but they haven't got over the top. And I think that kind of, um, I don't know how to describe it, but, you know, just that kind of movement, you know, lack of movement, upward trajectory and getting over the top, you know, even when you have great players like Luca Garza or or the Murray brothers or all timers like Jordan Bohannon, you know, you just couldn't get over the top. And then you look at that and that's kind of where we are that, you know, your, your passionate fans have become apathetic because this coach can't get them over the top in their perception. And that's no big 10 championships. That's no speed 16s, you know, other than the the tournament, which kind of counts, but then there's, you know, then the mid-level of fan is kind of like, eh, I don't know, you know, (laughs) and then the low level fan is completely off. And, you know, and then you look at the students, they're not coming, they're not interested. So, You've got a major league problem. And I talked, I, I had a one-on-one with Beth Getz at the final four and we talked a lot about basketball and she's like, we've got a lot of work to do here. And, and uh, you know, it's going to be collective. It's going to be with her and Fran. It's not going to just, you know, she understands the apathies there and they've got a lot of work to do, but I think this is the moment that people don't want to accept that price tag, Rob, and we know it, but you got to, even if it's not, even if it's a little bit embellished, even if it's Fran saying phenomenal and spectacular like he always does. And so you add a hundred thousand dollars to it, but this is reality. Iowa can't afford to play, pay its best player, you know, and people go, oh, he's not his best player. Well, he is. Deal with it. Because if he goes to Indiana, they're going to love him there. And uh, he plays hurt, plays tough. So, and he you know, does play defense. Whoever says he doesn't play defense is an idiot. Yeah, exactly. I mean, <laughs> I mean, are you watching? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think, Scott, it's like we said, there's so many layers to this. Moving the student section and upgrading Carver Hawkeye Arena and, you know, doing more for the fans, whether it be shirts and skins before football games or some type of summer league or whatever, whatever you have to do. But I think you have to do a lot, as, as Beth told you. It, it's more than just one or two things here or there. And I think, and another, and if people are are that wacky about that number for Tony, and again, these are unsubstantiated numbers because we don't have access to the actual numbers, but look at A.J. Store from Wisconsin. He goes, and Kansas is interested. This is reported. Again, mm-hmm. just like Fran is reporting that it's half a million for Tony. He wanted a million. Kansas was offering seven fifty. dollars he, wa- he didn't take it. That, think about that money, guys. And yeah. AJ Store was a tremendous player for Wisconsin, but I wouldn't say he's light years ahead of Tony Perkins. They're exactly. similar. Exactly. 
I mean, and that's the market right now. You know, players are going to try to get what they can get because, you know, will Tony Perkins play in the NBA? I doubt it. Maybe he's a, you know, a, a up and down guy with the G League or something like that. But but this is their opportunity to finally make to make maybe the most money that they've ever had, you know, and you can do it in front of big audiences in the United States. And and so and to me, the it's once you accept this, then, then it's like, okay, what do you do about it? And at this point, it's about raising money, but it's, that's holistic. That's not just going out with your hand, you know, a hat in your hand and saying, pay us, or we can't keep our players in threatening fans to, to, to pay up because that's not healthy. Fans aren't going to feel like I want to do this out of the goodness of my heart and be excited you know, the, the coach is going to have to, to come through. This is going to have to be a Fran thing. Um, he's going to have to find a way to energize the base again, you know, and that could be meeting, you know, knocking on doors and <laughs> soul and, and yeah. Ankeny, you know, or it could be, you know, staging events. It could be adding things like, um, you know, n- not prime time necessarily, but events like that, you know, maybe let's, Let's have um, a little barnstorming yeah, exactly. in the summer around the state. You know, once a week, you go to, hey, let's go to Decorah and yeah. let's go to uh, Mason City and let's let's go to Des Moines and let's go to North Liberty. And and we're going to have a practice and we're going to have a celebration and we're going to talk to you guys about this. And autographs then, and yeah. do all that. You know, and then the players can get paid through the swarm for their mm-hmm. appearances. And then you have you know, the coach and other people connected to the, to the NIL and the collective come out and say, this is really important here. That's how you do it. That's, it may not be what you want to do, but, but you're going to have to do it until the fans are happily departing with their writing checks. And right now there's, there's, there's not a much, you know, people aren't just full of income here in the state of Iowa. You can't just say, yeah, I need to go pay 10,000 to the athletic department so I can have these great seats in Kinnick. And then also 10,000 here, 10,000 there. It's not monopoly money. So you've got to, you got to make sure that people get something for that and not just, you know, victories on a, in a January evening. Yeah, and I mean, I know I, I understand the fan frustration. Like, why should we have to pay more? Um, we give a ton already, as Scott said. You know, we have to pay for our seat, li- for lack of a better term, license. You got to donate to to sit where you want to sit, whether it be in Kinnick or Carver, and then you're donating to iClub stuff, and now you're earmarking some money to make sure that Jay Higgins comes back and those guys come back and. Where does it stop, right? That's mm-hmm. why, they, to me, this basketball thing does not fall on the fans. I think they're, they they certainly have ownership in this in terms of if they want to support men's basketball. But this really is the athletic department and figuring out, all right, we've got, all, we've got fans donating enough to football, the Swarm, to make that work. Where do we get the money from that's coming in to get to basketball? Um, maybe we don't have like a, a facilities project. Maybe we put that on hold, whatever. But you got to do something now to get this up and running. Because if you're in the camp that says, hey, we need a new coach to, to uh, you know, for an injection of excitement here, who are you hiring with this NIL? Mm-hmm. What coach out there, what type of coach are you going to draw when you tell them, yeah, we lost Tony Perkins to Indiana, but come on in and be our coach, you know? And to Fran's credit, he certainly has things that are um, – that you wish were different. He, he, mm-hmm. the, the tempers, his tantrums, things like that that have happened through the years, run-ins with officials. But the guy knows talent. The guy can identify and develop talent. And to me, Scott, that's kind of what you need in this situation, right? <laughs> is somebody that can, and maybe the new guy is better at that. And maybe he's better at raising funds and maybe he's better at all that. But that's the type of situation right now is it's not an easy fix financially, whether it's Fran or somebody else. And that's really at the root of this. And again, I don't want you guys to think that I'm saying the fans have to foot mm-hmm. the bill here, but it needs to be 
it needs to be taken care of, or Iowa's just going to drop to the bottom of the Big Ten rankings. And, that, and at this point, there's only only the fans can take care of this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, until the athletic department can officially pay, which I, you know, I did write a big story about this on the published on Thursday was pay for play I, I, with a lot of experts. Let me ask stuff. you this. You have a better handle on this. Sorry to interrupt, but I want to kind of make this point. Could the athletic department say, say fan X is saying, mm-hmm. hey, I've got five grand and I'm ready to donate. Can the athletic department can steer that towards men's basketball? Hey, this is where we really need the money, men's basketball. So can we move it there instead of donating to, you know, whatever facilities project or whatever general fund for the athletic department? I think that's where the athletic department can help. And that that's where Beth is different than her predecessor. Yeah. And Gary would have been like, you know, we, nope. we got to continue to Give make me money. money. Give yeah. Me the money. Right. Uh, <laughs> but but Beth understands. And she said, we are Iowa, meaning everything connected to it is Iowa. And, and that is, um, you know, a, a cheerful giver type of thing. <laughs> and uh, and so you want to make sure that people are energized with where they're going to give it to and also put it to the best use. And I talked to her at, you know, links here, you know, I'll go through a couple of quotes from our one-on-one related to men's basketball. And, uh, and she said, we're not going to put our head in the sand. I hear from fans. I understand their concerns. And we're going to be trying to be responsive to that. And, uh, you know, and she mentions the word apathy. You know, I, I she, she's like, we want all of our programs and certainly men's basketball to compete at the highest level and recognize that there's been a little more apathy than perhaps they've seen in the past. So alongside coach, we're not going to just let this go. It's how do we dive in and figure out what are the concerns? How can we address them and, and position ourselves con- for continued success? And a lot of that is, again, she has the idea. She understands that, um, that NIL, that the, the players matter, you know, because again, you know, you, you let's, let's look at last year and project to next year. If you, if you have enough money to go out and get one more player for this team, you're, you're back in the tournament. And if you're in the tournament, you have a shot at, you know, if you're a power five team, you know, we've seen good power five teams rise from seven to all the way to the final four. If they get one score to replace Chris Murray and all of a sudden, okay, now you're in the tournament. Now you're a six seed. Then you upset the three in the second round. You're in the sweet 16 and then you beat the two. And then, you know, maybe you're in a position then to go, wow, we, you know, we had a great year. This is awesome. Um, but you didn't have enough money to do that. And so you get, um, you get Evan bronze, you know, returns home and then, and you get Ben Cricky, who was a good player, but you know, not, not the best player in the, in the country. And no offense to him, but just reality. Then th- this next year, not only now you're losing your guys, <laughs> you know, and Patrick's a different situation. That's that's mental health as much as anything. But with when you're dealing with Tony Perkins, how are you going to replace him? Well, Brock Harding. OK, well, you know, that's fine. But you're also losing somebody who's had four years of experience, three years of as a starter and is a considered a quality player. And, um, you know, and one thing I'll add to to Beth when I asked her about renovations to Carver and, you know, some of the things, you know, that she said is it's a needed project, but it's not about uh, making it look like the best in the Big Ten. You know, it's not. And she said, I do think that it's a critical facilities project for us, not in the sense of the arms race, not that we don't want it to be beautiful and one of the best in the Big Ten, but it isn't about chasing this. It's about how do we make sure we have a facility that best serves our fans, our athletes, and our students. And, you know, so it's about bathrooms. <laughs> you know? Functionality, and, and, man. It's yeah. functionality, making it fan fan friendly in terms of being able to get a drink or go yeah. to the bathroom. Right. And that's, you know, so they're talking about putting a premium club space in, in the arena, but with bathrooms in there, with an elevator in there to help free up some of the others, along with more bathrooms for other people, for the general, for gen pop, <laughs> you know, but stuff like that. So I, I think she gets it, but 
you know, it is about the, 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 we've talked a long time about this, but it is about the, the fan base being interested enough to want to come to compete, you know, and they're going to have to, or I was going to fall behind. And you think the NIT NIT might be a um, ceiling for this program, especially now when you're adding in four more programs that have quality levels of a success in them recently, whether it's in the tournament or close to it. Um, And, you know, everybody else isn't sitting still in the normal big 10, you know, this was a down year for Maryland. This was desperately a down year for Michigan and you still lost to them. So, I mean, for Fran, who's what the, the last six years, he's won 10 or more games and 11 out of the last 12, they finished in the upper half of the big 10. You know, that's you, you got to you got to take all that information equally. You got to weigh it equally. OK, you didn't win two games in March, but you did win at least 10 out of 20 in the Big Ten for the last six years. How do you piece that together? How do you get better? How do you take that? And that's that's Beth Getz's job. And she's coming in at the, a really difficult moment in Iowa sports. And there's some decisions to make. But the most important one. To me, you know, football is different, but the most important one outside of football is how do you energize the men's basketball fan base? It's probably existentially to the athletics department. I hate to say this. It's probably more important than even what happens with women's basketball, because this is a sport that actually that generates the second most revenue and the only other sport that generates revenue on campus or more money than loses. Yeah, hopefully the gap closes a little bit with women's basketball mm-hmm. now rising up, new TV contract, things like that. Maybe things happen better there, but yeah. that doesn't mean that basket, men's basketball is any less important. You're still trying to to make money. And like Scott said, Beth's got her work cut out for her. We'll talk about this stuff quite a bit. We have been talking about NIL for four years, and uh, we'll continue to talk about it. And the basketball situation is certainly – uh, one to monitor because it's it's really it's really the biggest concern right now when it comes to the Iowa athletic department is how to push forward with men's basketball and uh, we'll find out how they do that. Uh, Lana, let folks know that support for the podcast comes from Systems Unlimited, celebrating 50 years of providing services to people living with disabilities and mental health needs throughout East Central Iowa. A list of their services and upcoming events can be found at sui.org. That is sui.org. Thank you to Systems Unlimited for supporting the podcast and, more importantly, the great work that they've been doing in the community for over half a century. Systems Unlimited, thank you very much. We're going to hear from a few more sponsors now. Scott and I will be back on the other side to talk a little women's basketball and spring football. Hang in there. We are back to let you know that switching is easy. We do it all the time. We switch on the lights. We switch TV channels. Some of us switch partners while square dancing. Well, that's a stretch. But what's not a stretch is how you can switch and save with State Farm. In fact, State Farm agent Chad Birch right here in Iowa City can switch you over so you can start saving today. Chad and his team are ready to welcome you to the State Farm neighborhood with Chad Birch. It's easy to switch and save. Just give them a call when you want the real deal, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. What, what were you going to say, Scott? You ready to do do Oh, yeah. <laughs> Here we go, do si do Thank you to Chad Birch and the folks at State Farm for supporting the podcast. We appreciate that. And uh, another popular uh, State Farm uh, sponsored athlete. We're not athletes. We're, we're, no. we're, I don't even think we're media personalities. Hey. I don't know what we are, but Caitlin Clark is a star and she's, she's sponsored by state farm. Hey, and, I'm, uh, I, I'm athletic. <laughs> <laughs> he's People, the athletic. Yeah. I'm, my athletic is gone. <laughs> as, as we say, they, they call us the athletic Scott Doctorman. And I'm like, you betcha. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Yeah. I didn't think about that. But that is, uh, that's that's uh, yeah, that's good. Um, but uh, we knew it was coming, Scott. But it's here. Um, the Caitlin Clark era is over. 
at Iowa. It came to a conclusion on Sunday with a loss to South Carolina in the national championship game. You were out at Cleveland and got to take in all of that wonderment and uh, was just a great run. I mean, you think about two straight national championship games, um, one of the greatest players to ever play women's college basketball. Some will argue that she's the best, but that's, <laughs> that's another discussion, the <laughs> argument over the goat, but um, just fun, just, a, just a great time. And I feel like people took advantage, didn't take it for granted and soaked it up and uh, we'll have those memories for a lifetime. Yeah. I'm there with you. Um, I think most people that I know of almost all, took this one to heart and they just, they love this team. Like unlike any team we've ever seen, it was, I kind of compare the Iowa women's basketball team to one of those small town basketball teams or, and that they're going, they're great. And they they're going to state and everybody looks at the, the girls like they're, they're from their neighborhood. Maybe they, they babysat my kid or they saw that kid growing up. That's kind of the way that, the state and the fan base has adopted this program that they think of them in personal terms. Like, you know, they talk about them in first name basis, like Gabby and, you know, and Caitlin, of course, but, and Kate and, you know, and, and the nicknames that stick. And um, so I think people really got into this. And, and one of the things I think they appreciated that I could just tell from some of the people I talked to were once they beat LSU, it was like the rest of this is gravy. We got to the final four again, you know, because Iowa, as we know, Rob has a history in, in the major sports of not living up to expectations or, you know, they start the year high. I mean, I think back to like 2010 football and top 10 football team. They had a lot of injuries and they lost some close games to some really good teams, but they still, they, they won eight games. We expected them to go, potentially go to the Rose Bowl type of thing. And there's a lot of seasons like that. Men's basketball, of course, has a ton. But this was a year where it was going to be tough. And it was tough. And they still got there. And fans just soaked it all up and were just so happy. And they they and that's what was fun to see. And it was fun to see it up close because the players really felt that way too. You know, we went to those games right before they left to – to go to you know, Albany and it was just, I mean, pandemonium, <laughs> you know, and fans love this team and they will always love this team. And, and so it, to me, this, that's what makes it most rewarding. I wrote a column after they lost that I said, the one thing that stands out is just the smiles, the way people are happy about this team and, and to see people happy is there's a priceless factor now that we're old dudes they just don't get from anything else to see the smiles in the community of 50 year old women, you know, just happy because they love this team and they're winning and they're winning with great people. And then to see 14 year old girls, you know, that are just, you know, like, like they just saw Justin Bieber, or Taylor Swift and, you know, and then to see the eight year olds squealing with delight when, when Caitlin Clark signs their autograph and, um, it was just a, it was a historic run and one that will never be duplicated, but I think we all just feel fulfilled either covering it or watching it, whatever. I, I, I can't think of a better year of a better season that I was ever had than what we just experienced. Yeah. And I think the nice part is that it was more than, you know, it was Iowa's, and it's been Iowa since, you know, forever. It's a great women's basketball program with a great history, a great history of players. Um, you know, you talk about Michelle Edwards and mm -hmm. you go down the list, Angela Smith, players that, that impacted WNBA too, at, you know, early in the process of the WNBA and seeing it built. And then this team comes along and it's a phenomenon, really. I mean, it's mm -hmm. filling up arenas around the country People are lining up hours before the game starts at other schools to get in to watch this team. The autographs, the you know, the people just standing there when when they come into the tunnels and out, you know, Caitlin like veering off to sign autographs all over the place. And just I'm not sure. Not only will we not see this at Iowa, 
But this is a moment in time for this sport that we may not see again, just in terms of having, you know, on a smaller scale, almost like a Beatles, like you mm-hmm. said, Taylor Swift type of type of effect where this brought people in that weren't even really huge women's college basketball fans into the sport. And that's the impact I think that will be lasting forever is that they changed. And I know that's kind of become the term this week mm-hmm. is they changed the game. And I, I, when my column from Sunday, that's what I, I wrote in there too. They did, they changed the game. Yeah, no question. They did because you know, the, the, there are people who kind of the reverse of the men's basketball situation we just talked about is the fact that we've got, you know, grown men who never really paid attention at all. Now, what channel are they on? I got to watch them. I got to make sure I'm there to watch them. You've got, you know, grown women buying the the t-shirts, wanting to support this team in any way, shape or form, willing to buy tickets for next year because they just want to say, you know what? I might not go to as many games next year, but I want to go there to support Lisa and Jan and this, this staff. I want them to feel that support and that love. And as you said, you know, the, going to Rutgers, going to Northwestern where there'd be a couple hundred people at the most games and, um, you know, to sell it out. And then uh, I always go back to the moment when I went, Ooh, this is, a, this is even bigger than I thought it was, was I think it was ABC seven in Chicago did a, um, they, they did this um, uh, like pregame report. They were out talking to fans standing, waiting to get in and there were a bunch of like 14 year old girls from the Chicago suburbs who play basketball and the squeals, you, you know, again, it was, that's why I said, it was like, you know, be, you know, I'm a believer or whatever, you know, Taylor Swift concert. I mean, it was just like, ah, I gotta see her, you know, and the high pitched squeals and stuff because they're seeing somebody like them up close. They're seeing somebody who, you know, this happens in all walks of life, but this is a, you know, a girl from a suburban girl from the, the Des Moines area went to a Catholic school, went to a a big 10 university, and now is traveling the big 10, the Midwest. These players usually that were this good, went to UConn, went to Tennessee, went to other places, not in the Midwest. And now she's, she's showing swagger. She's making shots that nobody can make, not men's basketball. There's only one player on the planet who can make those shots. And that's Steph Curry. And she's doing all of this and she's throwing, so in swagger, but she's also showing I can be who I am. You know, I can still be, you know, sweet. I can still be smart. I'm still a 4.0 student and I'm still going out on the court and I'm going to kick your ass and tell you about it. And I'm, and we're going to win. And that's, that's what makes it also special and unique and fun and why the whole country. And then you throw on the NIL component, which is what it's all about, that all these companies want to attach their brand to her and she's making all this money. That's, I, you know, that that's why this is a phenomenon. And I agree with you that we will see, you know, there's, they paved a path for the sport, but I don't know that we'll see this type of excitement that we've saw because look at the TV ratings, look at them when Caitlin's playing versus when she isn't like even the, the Friday night game, South Carolina and NC state had half the number. It was like 7 million versus 14 million. So it, it's it's something that will not it, it'll be a surprise if we see something like this for a long time. Yeah, just a phenomenon, and um, you know, end of an era, as we said. And now, Monday night, she'll hear her name called, first pick of the WNBA draft, and then we get to see what type of impact she can have on that league, even if there are people complaining about her that are in that league and don't understand that she will make them more money and raise the profile of the league. And uh, we've seen it before, you know, with the jealousy with Michael Jordan being freezed out and uh, Tiger Woods, some of the blowback that he got. And uh, this is a similar situation, different scale, obviously, from an international standpoint, but she had people from France coming over and other international people. We had somebody, John Bonenkamp talked to somebody over in the UK who wanted to do an interview over what it was like. So, I mean, it's, it's amazing. And I'm, I'm just looking forward to, and we were going to talk about 
what Iowa looks, Iowa, Iowa women's basketball looks like after Caitlin Clark. We'll do that next week because we're running a little low on time and I want to get spring football in here. But um, did want to wrap this conversation, Scott, with just what it's going to be like Monday night, you know, in that draft. And then, and then it's, you know, every we've seen all the pics, Photoshop pictures of her in the Indiana Fever jersey, but it's going to be real now. And it's not that long. They start playing next month and uh, she's going to go right back into that. So it's kind of, it's kind of ideal, right? You're going right from the, the the excitement of this basketball tournament into the WNBA. There's not like too much of a lag. That could be really helpful here. It could be. The only thing I worry about is um, how does her fatigue, you know, body <laughs> yeah. fatigue, you know, yeah. and and as much attention as she's had. There's been, a, I think that with her, I can tell, you know, that it's worn her down mentally. I, I agree. That it's it, this year she's been able to stay above it, which I admire greatly, but, but you can see the stress is, is really taking its toll on her. She doesn't have the same joy that maybe she did. She's acted like a pro and, and she's done a phenomenal work, but um, you know, and now she gets to go in and be the face of that new league and she's going to have all that attention. And, um, and then she has all this, <laughs> cat fighting, you know, um, you know, with all these former players, you know, yelling, ag- you know, yelling about her and discussing breaking her down and all this kind of thing. And I'm just like, how ridiculous she is the one that's pushed this to the forefront. This is everything you guys want. Your sport now is a national sport. There are f- more than 4 million people who watched the women's championship than watched the men's championship. Um, this is, everything you guys have wanted for forever don't tear her down because if you tear her down and push her away and if you make her look bad then next thing you know um all the interest the casual interest will fade very very quickly and then you're left with uh you know the what you were before which is a good lead don't get me wrong but it's not gonna be i mean at this point i would say the ratings for caitlin clark games are going to I mean, the interest is going to, you know, jump over Major League Baseball for, for quite a while this summer. What did so, they announce this week, Scott? All but one game will be televised, the Fever the, games? 36 out of 40. Okay, so four won't be. Yeah. So, um, and that's like they had, what, a few? Yeah, like one or three last year, you know? <laughs> yeah. So Yeah, but she's really not, she's not, she's not really impacting things. No, no. It's, it's, it's everybody else, right? You know? <laughs> Uh, so i get the jealousy from the standpoint of hey we've been there we've done that we're we're good we're great tarasi's a great player sue bird brianna stewart those guys are great players some of the greatest that have ever played the game but sometimes you just have to accept that um timing and um somebody else just has the it fact and Caitlin mm-hmm. has the it factor, and you should embrace that because, again, it's going to make you money, and it's going to increase the exposure of your sport, which you've been fighting for your whole life. Yeah, exactly. And I, I tell you what I was miffed about, Rob, was on Friday night, Iowa gets one of the biggest wins in school history, beats UConn at the Final Four, and Sports Center had its highest number of viewers ever after that ever if you can believe that in a little late time period and yet the the conversation was almost exclusively about the the moving screen which was legitimate i mean if you if if you know anything about basketball you you know what what really it should have been was an analysis of how it happened which is that Paige beckers didn't go close enough to to edwards if she was closer to leah edwards then gabby marshall runs into her when she's set instead, she went wide game, giving Gabby a lane and allows Aaliyah Edwards forces her to, to move her, not only her back leg, but her front leg and stretch out and then shoulder block her. I mean, with her elbow and, and everything. And it was like, that's an easy call. And instead it's all oh, that call sucked. We got robbed of a, you know, no, that's what happens. That that's argument, an- and you can't make that call on that top point of the game. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's like there's, you know, you're, you're talking about like a 
you can't call pass interference in the last five seconds of the football yeah, game. Anything goes. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like, okay, well, why don't you just punch her in the face while she's at it? No, yeah, that's part of the game. You know, we, we don't call fouls with five seconds left. Um, you know, so <laughs> I was, I was really pissed because I was like, you stole joy from fans at that mm-hmm. point. And, uh, and then to top it off, you've got a network who's broadcasting this game that doesn't have rights to the big 10 that's based in Connecticut, that has a separate program with Connecticut, UConn greats. And then on the broadcast, you have one of the greats of all time providing color analysis. I mean, maybe they're trying to be even handed, but the, the appearance of it is, you know, foobar, you know, I mean, you know, there's, you know, when you've got all of that, it's like, who can stick up for Iowa here? Nobody. I mean, come on. That's, that's where I, I came across that. Now, again, Iowa didn't win the championship. So that was its best win. That was his last win. And instead, all we're talking about is, you got, got robbed. You know, Gino Oriema, well, I don't care what the stats say. We we won the game. No, you didn't. You know, how many teams tell you that to you? you know? Yeah. Yeah, I don't have any sympathy for Gino. Mm-hmm. Uh, or UConn. They've done a lot. And it's, sometimes it's hard when you're not the – the lead dog anymore to, to yeah. deal with that. And also when somebody else is getting atten- more attention than you and they're not in the league yet, I get it all, but hopefully people calm down now that this is over and she's going into the league. And um, I know Leah Boston's happy. I think she's going to be ecstatic yeah. to be, uh, to be paired with, with Caitlin and, and we'll see how they do. That's Monday night again for the WNBA draft. And, as I said, we'll talk more about um, a look ahead to the Iowa women's basketball roster next week. And who knows, by then something could have changed and there could have been an addition or a subtraction. So it's NIL portal time. So stay tuned on that stuff. Scott, let's talk a little uh, spring football before we get out of here. It's funny, spring football at the end. Of the month. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we haven't really had a lot of access. Thankfully, the women's basketball team had a great run. So everything's getting crammed in from a media standpoint here uh, in the middle of the month. We had two opportunities to speak with uh, student athletes this week, defense on Tuesday, offense yesterday. Um, we don't get to select who we're talking to. It's provided to us by the university. So some some interesting uh, people that were were put in front of us, but all really good interviews and enjoyed talking to them. And I think um, what everybody wants to know, what everybody's waiting for is what's going to happen on this offense. Can this offense figure it out? And uh, we won't know until the season rolls around. Uh, but we're, here's where I am on this, Scott, and we've talked about this before. I'm not – Lucy's not pulling the football away from me. Again this year, when it comes to preseason hype about the offense, but I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged by what I've heard, and if they can put what they're telling us into practice and action, I think they may have some. Yeah, I'm with you. <laughs> it's like fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Fool me 15 times in a row, shame on me. <laughs> shame on me. Shame on me. And I'm not gonna go there again. Well, maybe I will. <laughs> and. Uh, I think, first of all, it's different and different is better because you know why the past was last, <laughs> you know, the worst of all time, you know, the woat instead of the goat of offenses. <laughs> so when you're the woat, it's time for a change. And from what our conversations about how has this offense changed? Well, you know, I, I wanted to get a lot from the linemen because I think they offer a really good perspective. They're not changing their fundamentals, their techniques, and and they should neither and then they shouldn't. I mean, that is <laughs> that's that's universal. You know, where you know how they get vertical off the ball, where they they place their backside knee. You know, how they dig in it. That shouldn't change. But what has changed is everything about it. You know, the eye candy, the movement, the motions. You know, I said, are you guys still running like outside zone, inside zone, the outside slant? And they're like, yes, but they're making it look different. And they had to. And this is what was kind of frustrating to me over the last few years, Rob, when it came to talking with Brian Ferentz is I would go through um, like how often when they ran jet sweep, I kept these numbers myself. This isn't a PFF or anything like that. When they ran jet sweep, 
um, in pre-snap. How, uh, what was the yards per carry? How was the passing game materialized? And it was the numbers were so much better than what they were when they weren't doing it. And part of it is, you know, Kirk complains and he's right. Cut blocking has changed the game. They can't cut block anymore on the backside, especially, which enables linebackers to flow freely. Now, when you have more motion and Brian would do that from time to time, and then he wouldn't do it. And it's like, why aren't you doing it? It's working. And, um, and now that they're doing it on each and every down, what it's forcing Iowa's defense to do, and this is a very good defense, is it's keeping eyes. It can't flow freely to the ball because there's more movement and it's enabling them, their linemen to get blocks, ad- advantageous blocks. And as that happens, their yards per carry are going to go up all, you know, across the board. And so that's what I really like to hear. The passing game has different concepts. You know, the routes, um, you know, I'm talking to like Caden Weijin, especially and, um, and, and Luke, but especially Caden, you know, he's, he described it as that, and, and Caleb Brown, that Bud Meyer and Lester are really working in tandem to show them what they want from each and every route, how they want to run. So it is kind of being more taught at, you know, holistically as opposed to just one person. And, and so what we're seeing is a different scheme, you know, and also um, more teaching. Now, what does that mean for quarterbacks? I'm not even going to go there because they don't have their guy out there. <laughs> they may not even have their guy on campus. But, um, but for the other parts of the game, I think it's a plus. Yeah, no question. And we've – been talking about it for the last several years about Iowa's offense being less predictable, um, you know, performing pre-snap motion to give the defense something to think about. As Scott said, you know, mess with their eyes, freeze them up a little bit, give your guys an advantage, put your guys in an advantageous situation to put the defense maybe on its heels a little bit and not know what's coming. And that's, that's, I I like that concept and I like that approach. Now you have to marry that with execution, right? And getting all of this stuff crammed in and however many, what's it, 15 spring practices, Mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. And then having to come back in the summer and, uh, you know, in August and and build on it there. Um, You you wonder how much of a learning curve there's going to be, but, it feels like they're going in the right direction. It's just a matter of how can you marry um, this philosophy? How much um, is the head coach going to be hands off when push comes to shove and the 70,000 are in Kinnick and Mm -hmm. things like that. So that's to me is still where I'm like, okay, I want to get excited. I want to be encouraged and I am encouraged, but I'm going to be measured as well because of what we've seen here for, you know, how long's Kirk been here? 25 years? <laughs> 25 years. 26 years, years going on yeah. 26 years. So right. we know the philosophy and the foundation. And, and we've wondered this, Scott. We saw Greg Davis couldn't do it. We saw Brian Ferentz can, couldn't do it. Can, uh, is Tim Lester the guy that can unlock the offense under the parameters of which the head coach wants? You know what? Uh, as much as I want to say, yeah, he can do that. I can't say that because we haven't seen it yet. You know, now, and we're not going to, there, there are going to be flashpoints. We can't say it on the first game of the year against what Illinois state, right. you know, because they should win that game convincingly. We could somewhat say that with Iowa state, and then it's going to be halfway through big 10 season. And then they get to a game against Wisconsin or somebody, then we'll see. And, um, What I'm encouraged about, and and this is the best part, is that Kirk is largely working with the offensive line, that he wants, he's working with their techniques and their footwork and their execution, as opposed to worrying about what Tim Lester is doing with the quarterbacks and, and what they're running play wise. And, and I think that's what this program needs now, you know, just head coach, you worry about, you're an expert, you are as good as there ever has been when it comes to teaching fundamentals on the offensive line, go kind of worry about that and manage the program, which you've done an excellent job of for 25 years. 
don't mess with the offense right now. Let him do it. If you see something, say something, as they say at the airport uh, <laughs> later on. But, um, you know, Caleb Brown is, is, you know, said he's working more of an F, which is more of a slot. And I think that's really interesting because I think that really enhances him as a, as a player because he's not real big, tall wise, but he can run a slot. And it's kind of like, you know, and I'm talking to one of the, the staffers yesterday, it was kind of like, this is kind of what we wanted out of Tyrone Tracy and kind of slot slash run TJ Washington's doing the same thing. Now they've made him more of a wide receiver. Um, you, you look at the offensive line and is there a, um, an, a draft pick or first round draft pick like Caden Proctor was no, but there's um, certainly, you know, enough depth, that now you feel like they should take steps forward. And then you have a, 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 a tight end who probably will be, uh, if not a first rounder, you know, the top 50 guy, in my opinion, next year. So there's a lot to like here. And can they put it all together? And then what happens at quarterback is, you know, starting this summer, you know, Cade McNamara is throwing, moving a little bit. That's good. They're trying to really rein him in. Don't do this. You know, don't roll, <laughs> yeah. you know, with an ACL tear still working your way back, but, um, and watching him throw, you know, he's, he's, he's got some accuracy, you know, that they haven't had. So I, there's a lot to like. Yes. And, and another kind of, um, call we've had, you know, wanting to see is the coaches, the offensive coordinator, using the pieces and putting them in the spots where instead of trying to jam them into a spot that, you know, you've tradi traditionally had maybe, you know, a wide receiver using that as an example, maybe playing Tyrone Tracy out of position because you, you, you have three guys that look like slot guys find ways, you know, whether it's Terrell Washington jr. Or whatever, Find what I'm encouraged by that too. Putting guys in position where they can best um, succeed with their given skill set. No question. I look back and and Tracy's a good person to just kind of bring up because a he's a great guy and he's going to go in the NFL draft next week as a running back. Now they also uh, I had people saying you know we we tried to switch him to running back he wouldn't hear it. And then they tried to switch him this first year at Purdue with running back. He wouldn't hear it there. It wasn't until he got to his last year that he said, okay, I probably should. You know, I'm not going to go to pros. This time, but one thing that they didn't do with Tyrone that they could have done is make him a slot guy. You know, they basically put Nico Ragaini in that position and they said, okay, you're an X. Well, Tyrone's not an X. Tyrone, that's a guy you've got to win one on one matchups and usually you got to be a bigger guy, you know, like a Brandon mm -hmm. Smith type. You know, uh, Tavon Smith is also a decent, you know, and they didn't do a very good job with him either. They didn't do a very good job with anybody. But, you know, Tyrone should have been, hey, let, let's move you to the slot too, you know, and alternate there and have somebody else run an X. I mean, that was the way to do it, you know, because he's quick, he's elusive, he's physical in the middle of the field. And they did chose not to. And he couldn't win one on one matchups very often against corners, can get open. And it was just, and I, it seems like, you know, it, because there is a blank slate that Tim Lester and, you know, maybe Bud Meyer to an extent will look at this and say, what do we do to put our players in the best position to win these matchups? And if that's Caleb Brown and, and TJ Washington running slot in the middle of the field, everybody's working everywhere, but they're going to play out of that position a lot. That's actually, that's going to help the offense so much more than, well, we need to put you here because we put you here, which is kind of the, banging their head on the wall that they've done for several years now. Yep. Some flexibility will be nice. It sounds like there is some, and again, I'm not poo-pooing anything. I'm just going to, uh, I'm, I'm taking the wait and see approach encouraged like what I hear so far, but I'm going to wait and see how it, um, how it develops and, and what it looks like when the season rolls around. But uh like Scott said, the bar is pretty low <laughs> like yeah. on the ground. 
Yeah. <laughs> it's like uh, doing the limbo by walking <laughs> through a doorway, you know, <laughs> you, know the, yeah. you know, going into the garage door when it's like six feet high, you know, it's like, yeah, we can do this. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll see what happens when they play Ohio state or at Michigan state or Wisconsin at home and stuff. You'll get, you'll understand then, you know, even Iowa state, I think we really good. It'll be pretty good this year. So there there's a lot we'll, that will test this team, but you know, different already is better. <laughs> yes. Change is good. Yeah. Especially in this case. Yeah. Uh, like we did today, we changed yeah. our day of the week for uh, podcasting. We have Iowa football ne- next week as well. I think it's coordinators on Thursday. So that may be yeah. a little bit later. So we may be able to squeeze this podcast in on Thursday morning, but we'll let you guys know via social media when we're going to record next week. And as I said, we'll talk about, next year's women's basketball team kind of what the roster looks like now and and some possibilities moving forward they're involved with some transfer portal names there too that we'll get into next week and talk a little bit more recruiting get you ready for the spring game all of that good stuff so um what you got going on the athletics scott what can people read over there from uh from you (laughs) I wrote this uh, kind of long piece on pay for play and I participated, I covered a panel discussion with a lot of experts and also talked to the head of the NCAA and that appeared on Thursday. Nice. So that was uh, that was pretty detailed on where they think things are going to go and how are things, how things got there. Also wrote um, it's draft season and I'm on the draft team. So we did a kind of a, back and forth on what some of the things are going on in, in, in the draft, which is two, well, two weeks from yesterday, 13 days away. Um, and then I'm doing something on the gambling situation with Noah Shannon and what, you know, that's coming out early next week. So with all of that and Cleveland and uh, it's, it's for spring football, it's been, it's been nuts. So. Yeah. Check out at the athletic, uh, a lot of great content there from Scott and everybody else there. Um, at The Athletic and The New York Times to check them out. And uh, thank you guys for listening to the podcast. We really appreciate it. We appreciate our sponsors for helping us bring you these podcasts free of charge, no Patreon, any of that stuff. And uh, we hope you guys have a good weekend. It's supposed to be nice up in the Midwest here. It's supposed to have some summer-like weather. So enjoy that. Get out and get the yard work done. I'll be back. I'll be back from Kansas City on Sunday and uh, we'll talk to you in the mailbag next week and then we'll have the hotspot as well. So you guys be well and we'll talk to you soon. Say goodbye.